Hello, welcome back to Rust 101. This is video 37. My name's Andy. We have been talking about async. Uh, last time we talked about what the async and await keywords actually do, what the compiler does to sort of unwrap your code and turn it into something that it can call poll on. So the kind of, the, the missing piece here is who calls poll? Because when you're writing this async code, the whole point is you don't have to call poll because it's too confusing to, to unpack your code into that kind of state machine. The compiler does it for you, but someone's got to call poll. So we're going to answer the question of who calls poll, um, and it's going to involve runtimes. So most Rust code doesn't have much in the way of extra code that you don't see running in the background, which is often called a runtime uh, or runtime code. Um, and languages that have a garbage collector, they've got to have some kind of runtime that does the, the garbage collection. Um, uh, one of Rust's uh, selling points is it doesn't have much of that type of code. But when you're writing async, you need a runtime. And the reason you need a runtime is because you need something to call poll. Um, so when you start an async program, you, you have to launch some kind of thing which um, gets given the async tasks that you ask it to run. And it calls poll on them at the right time um, until they're completed and then picks up from where your code left off. So um, what does an async runtime do? Well, it, it's something that can um, spawn futures, which basically means add them to the list of tasks that need polling uh, and keep track of that list uh, and then call poll on each of those futures. Um, and in particular, when it calls poll is when it knows there's a chance that 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 future might make progress. So something we haven't gone into and we're not going to go into because it's really difficult and confusing, uh, other than to say this, is that um, it doesn't just randomly call poll every few milliseconds or something like that. Um, it will call poll when it's been woken up to say there might be something useful that this future can do. For example, um, a future that was listening for incoming data on an internet network request um, the it w wake would get called when the operating system says some new stuff has come in on that socket. Um, and they, then in the background, the runtime, the libraries around the runtime, um, when you, when you say wait for, you know, bytes from this, um, stream under the, under, in the background, the, um, the runtime will register with the, uh, operating system to say, tell me when, um, some bytes come in because that means this future might be able to make progress. And so when that happens, it calls wake and then wake means that we call poll on that future. And similarly, if there's a timer, uh, that you've set up, then under the, in the background, that timer, um, will say to the operating system, please tell me when this time happens <laughs> in some way I don't understand. Um, and again, it will call wake and that wake will cause the runtime to call poll. And that's how your poll method gets called. Um, other stuff that an async runtime can give you, um, and that Tokyo does give you, is um, a way of passing the work out to multiple threads um, so that you're getting parallelism for free if you're on a machine that can run multiple things at the same time, um, has multiple cores or CPUs. Uh, and also um, they give you libraries that you can use to do stuff like um, reading from a socket, um, opening a file, uh, timers, stuff like that. Uh, and this this bottom point is quite important um, because the runtimes give you um, the, that library code for things like listening on a socket, opening a file, waiting for a timer, then uh, they are incompatible with each other. So a lot of the stuff is in the standard library, like futures and the whole async await keywords. That's shared between the different runtimes, but at time of recording, um, this stuff about like creating a, um, a an async code that can listen to a timer or listen for um, top bytes over a network socket and all that kind of stuff, those are specific to each runtime. So if you write in code that uses that stuff, it will be code that is specific to one of the possible runtimes. Um, and you might think it would be better if there was just one runtime and everyone would be compatible with each other. Um, I, the direction that the Rust community is going is trying to share stuff that can be shared, but keep the advantages that there are to having different runtimes with different um, ways of looking at the world. Um, so maybe at some point we'll get to the point where we share the code that does the um, the async 
abst abstractions like reading from a network socket, um, but we still have different runtimes with different properties. So why would we have different runtimes? Well, here are some of the runtimes that currently exist. There's one called small, which is small, and I think potentially useful for um, uh, embedded devices, I'm not sure. Uh, and then there's async std, um, which um, attempts to provide stuff that looks almost exactly like the standard library stuff. Um, so you, the way you, you know, the method you call to open a file looks very similar to the way you would open a file in a completely synchronous way uh, using standard library functions. Um, that one used to be quite popular, maybe as popular as Tokyo, but recently, in the last couple of years, I'd say Tokyo looks like it's become the most popular. Um, if you're looking for a recommendation of what to what to use, just use Tokyo and don't think about it. Um, there's also one called Embassy, which is uh, focused on embedded stuff. And one of the one of the ways that embedded stuff might be different, by the way, is that you you might not want to use multiple threads on an embedded system. I mean, you might. It depends on the system. Um, but that means that some of those underlying primitives um, might be might work differently. And also that if you're using a runtime that doesn't support threads, then it removes some of the restrictions on some of the code that you can um, run in that runtime because you don't need your stuff to be send, whereas everything in Tokyo needs to be send because it might get run on any kind of thread. So um, there are some like corner details about why one runtime might be better for your use case. Um, and yeah, um, the note at the bottom again is very important. Um, the uh, some crates that are that do asynchronous stuff inside them, um, that is going to be specific to one of these runtimes. So at the moment, that kind of fracturing, but for the reasons that I've already given, that kind of fracturing is um, a problem. Uh, it's a pity. Uh, wouldn't it be nice if you could write some uh, an async library and you could use it on any of these runtimes? So as I said, yeah, just use Tokyo if you if you don't know, and that's what most of these crates do. Um, that I've seen, um, but maybe in the future someday um, we'll sort that stuff out so that um, we don't need to do it. By the way, if you're writing a crate that does uh, sort of async stuff but doesn't do like underlying details like opening files um, or timers or whatever, then you can write something that is actually cross runtime, but most async code ends up needing some of those specifics. All right, so let's have a quick look at how you write some Tokyo code. So now if you've, if you've, um, added a dependency on Tokyo to your cargo.toml by doing cargo add Tokyo or something like that, uh, now you have available to you this, um, macro, um, so you can say Tokyo colon colon main before your main function. And actually what that does is quite small. Like you can just manually write the code on a normal main method. Um, but the point is you need a way of crossing the bridge. You remember that all async functions are, are completely different from synchronous functions. You can't just call uh, an async, you can't just await an async function from an, a, a normal function. Um, you need to um, spawn your async, uh, you, you need to pass the future from your async function to some kind of spawn method um, in your runtime. So you can just have a normal main method that creates a Tokyo runtime and then says, spawn this task on this runtime. And that would call the, the presumably this do stuff function here is async. So you could just say, um, you know, call async, call do stuff and then, um, uh, uh, and then pass the answer into a spawn method. But the Tokyo colon colon main thing just makes that look nice and simple. So you can write a function called main, which is async. And it's just, you're immediately in the async world. You don't have to make that transition yourself. By the way, I've just noticed a bug in this slide. It should say do stuff bracket bracket and then dot await without the brackets. Um, apologies for that. So, okay. Um, so let's go a bit deeper with a, a more full example. So again, we've got a main method, um, with this Tokyo main annotation to, to say, please Tokyo, like create your runtime and spawn this thing as a, as the start off. And what this does is it uses this TCP listener, which is a Tokyo thing. So I remember I was saying that the, all the asynchronous, like underlying asynchronous libraries that you use um, are going to be specific to your runtime. So this one is specific to Tokyo. So give me a TCP listener. Listen on this port. Um, and if you don't understand all of this don't, don't, stuff, don't worry about it. But basically this is waiting for incoming uh, information from outside. 
Um, and it, this is async stuff, so, so we await it. And in this case, we just like crash if there's an error, like trying to bind to that port. And then we go into an infinite loop where we just say accept, which means like um, someone is trying to connect to this port and talk to me. Uh, so when that, when that happens, so this, this accept will kind of wait for that to happen. And when it happens, uh, give me back the socket that, um, that comes out of that, which is basically um, a way I can talk to that person. So, uh, yeah, every time someone connects, wait for that to happen, grab the socket, and then call my async function handle connection, which is up here. Um, and it, so this socket thing is a TCP stream. And then basically we read in from that stream into the, into a string, which we call name. And then we send back along that um, same socket, that stream, um, hello, and then that person's name. So this is like a, a working... TCP server, and we can try it out by using Netcat. Um, so Netcat is a program that lets you talk to a, a socket. So we're assuming that program is running in the background on that port, and then we can send the word Redis to the Netcat command saying, please send that to localhost, blah, and Netcat will just print out what it gets back, and what it gets back is, hello, Ferris. So this that, that thing, work, that program we just saw works, but does it scale? Uh, it doesn't scale because it's only handling one request at a time. So we have another look back. What this does is an infinite loop of awaiting um, the, the for us to get an answer from, uh, you know, to get someone to talk to, and then awaiting doing the talking before we go back again and try and look for someone else to talk to. So only one person is getting talked to at a time. And we can do better than that because... Um, our async runtime like does multi-threading for us without even ha us having even having to think about it. So we can change our main method to look like uh, wait for someone to talk to us, which we're still going to await, and then spawn a task. So this is how we, you know, you know I said we, you need to call spawn. Well, here, um, this is how we do it. We tell Tokyo, please spawn a thing. We give it a future. Remember, an async block returns a future. Um, so... Um, and then inside this feature, we call handle connection just like before and then do some return stuff. Um, but the key point is here, spawn immediately ends, right? It doesn't wait for handle connection to finish. This await inside here does not cause spawn to wait. Spawn Im immediately like takes the feature you've given it and goes off and pulls it um, in some other thread or, you know, some way that you don't care about. Um, and immediately we go back to waiting to see if someone else is going to talk to us. So this is this is an example of how we we've got the same handle connection code we had before. So everything feels nice and simple to us, um, but async has meant that that it being parallel or concurrent is um, it's just easy for us. Um, we just do this little bit of boilerplate of saying spawn this thing, and then it goes and it gets put in some kind of uh, list of tasks somewhere, list of features to get to, to dealt with later, and then they, those things get pulled and listened to and done. So you can see that async, um, notice by the way that this doesn't have to be multi-threaded at all. You could tell Tokyo uh, all this should run in one thread or you could use a runtime um, with slightly modified code that, that only ever uses one thread. Um, but all this stuff is concurrent. So while one, um, imagine this, um, um, imagine this handle connection code is doing something really slow here. Maybe it's not just reading in from the socket, but like waiting for something that's going to take ages. That's not going to block any of the other stuff and it, like handling other people's requests. Um, because the, every time you call a wait, remember, it kind of suspends what you're doing and, and goes off and does other stuff, other jobs that it can do. So even with only one thread running, um, async will give you that concurrency and the ability for you to be processing lots of people's requests all at the same time. Um, or like for requests to be part way through at the same time as each other, let's say. not If you've only got one thread, there's only actually one bit of code executing at a time, but um, it switches around between which, the code for which bit is getting run. So um, it really is a, a genius thing. Um, a, and it kind of originally come up with in the like Python twisted library and then Node.js, and I'm sure there were things before that that invented it. Um, uh, but this idea of lots of things going on at the same time, even though they're, they can actually all be processing on one thread, means that we can much more efficiently use our computers than when we just had to sit there 
um, waiting, uh, like a whole thread was locked up just waiting for more bytes to come through from the internet or something like that. Okay, so let's go slightly deeper just with a really quick introduction to um, how we could use this async stuff to do web stuff, like create, you know, creating a website. So there is a, there's a website called Are We Web Yet, which is about whether Rust is like ready for doing um, web stuff. And the answer is yes, um, it, it is now ready and it's very fast. Uh, lots of frameworks exist. The, the one that I heard of first was called Rocket. And then the one that I've used the most is called Actix Web. So Rocket, I think, was not very async. It may now be async. I'm not sure. Actix Web was the one that I learned that, um, really made use of this async stuff to make it super fast. And Actix Web was like right at the top of the list of fastest web servers for quite a long time. Don't know if it still is. Uh, and then warp, which is one way it requires you to think about things a bit differently. And I think some people think that the way it uh, thinks about the world is really cool, but I haven't used it. And then Axum is uh, a, a newer framework, which is very heavily async, like Actix Web, um, but very um, heavily uh, trying to lean on existing code, especially code in the Tokyo ecosystem. Um, so n not building its own versions of stuff, but using this semi-standard stuff that is in the Tokyo ecosystem. Like, Tokyo is becoming increasingly um, widely used, and Axum like, really buys into all the stuff that Tokyo gives you um, and the standard ways of thinking about things. Um, there are also um, lots of other web frameworks, and there's lots of ways of um, driving databases. And one of the really interesting uh, things about driving databases is that in some ways talking to a database can also can be inherently async but some of the most widely used libraries are not async so then how does you how do you fit that into an async library you need a way of saying to the runtime oh this thing might actually block for a while so you need to do it on a separate thread um, and, and the the runtimes do have ways of doing that uh, yeah so there's loads of there's loads of web stuff there's loads of templating libraries for making HTML um, based on, you know, a nice description of it or a template or something like that. Um, there, there's a ton of cool web stuff. Um, so you can do cool web stuff. There's also a ton of front-end frameworks. So you write Rust code that ends up getting converted, compiled into JavaScript that runs in your browser. Um, and lots of different approaches because front-end land is all about the different approaches and what's what, which way is going to win. So um, lots of cool um, web Rust stuff. Um, oh, by the way, most of them don't compile to JavaScript. They compile to WASM, uh, which runs in most modern browsers. Okay, so um, let's have a quick, deeper look at how you do Axum. We're going to go through this very quickly, but um, yeah. So um, when you're using Axum, so we've done we've done a, like a cargo add Axum to have Axum available, um, and and we've also got Tokyo available. Um, so you need both those dependencies to do it. So we create ourselves a, a main method. Um, and then we, we create something which is going to hold on to like, um, the information that all the different, um, web requests that we're handling need to have access to. So we tend to call this app state. Um, and because lots of different, um, um, tasks are going to be talking to it and probably from different threads, we need to wrap it all up in an arc, uh, and a mutex. So mutex means that only one thread can actually be dealing with the underlying data at a time. And the arc means that, um, Lots of, lots of things can like share ownership of it and uh, so on. Um, and then inside, we're just going to hold on to a vector. Uh, so just a list of something. And we'll see what it's a list of in a second. And then, so what we're all aiming, aiming for here. So this is the app state that's shared between everything. What we're aiming towards is we're going to bind. So basically create a server. Um, and start serving. Uh, down here and in order to do that bind stuff we need the address and we need an app and the app is what we're creating up here so the address is just like um, 127.0.0.1 or like whatever um, binding address you use so that would be something like 0 .0 .0 0.0.0.0 if you want to listen to um, all um, connections uh, or just locally it would be 127.0.0.1 so that's and then this is the port that we want to listen on um, so that's the way you, you say what address do I want to listen on? And then the app is where we say like what code is going to run to do stuff. So what we do is we create a, a router and then we give it lots of different routes by calling this root method. And, uh, in this case, we've only made one route, which is like slash, like as in 
the kind of the the kind of base basic bit of um like the top level of our website so just if you don't put in any star you know index.html or hello.html if you just put in slash and then after the slash so after the the, the web address of our server it, it accepts a parameter that's what this colon name means so if we basically say um if we open up in our browser 127.0.0.1 colon 3000 slash Andy, then we're passing in Andy as the name parameter here. And we're saying, um, when you, when you get a get request on that URL, give it to handler. And we'll see what handler is in a second, I think. Um, and we're also saying, by the way, the state, like the app state that you can have access to while you're processing that is app state. So now we've made an app. We've bound our server and told it this is your app you're going to serve up. Then we need to look at what handler is, which is the thing which actually runs code. So um, the type of yeah, so the vector that we saw in the on the previous slide, this app state that was a, a vector inside the arc of a mutex, it's actually we can we can see the type of it here. It's actually a vector of strings. So what it's doing is remembering all the names people have told us in the past. And you, the, the kind of core of any of your web code that you're writing when you're using Axum is one of these handler functions, which is an async function, which can have various different arguments. And, and Axum, like magically, depending on the arguments you say this, your function takes, will magically fill those in using information from the web request. So in this case, we, we say, I want to know, um, information from the path. So as in the URL that you typed into the web address, and, and that will give us that name argument that we saw in the root. Um, and also, I want the app state. Um, and I'm going to put that in a variable called past names. So you might not be familiar with like the left hand side. This would normally would just be a variable name colon a type, right? But what we're doing here is pattern matching and saying, actually, we know that this is going to be a state. Um, and inside, inside that state, so it's like state is like a type that, um, Axum gives us. We know it's going to be a state and we don't want to have to do like, give me this, you know, like if we just put a variable name X colon state brackets app state, we might have to call a method saying, give me the thing inside you. Actually, we'd have to say dot zero, I guess, to get past names out of it. So we're saying, just give me past names already. I know, I know it's a state. I don't care about that part. Give me the state that you're holding inside, which is this thing of type app state. Um, all right. So that was, anyway, if that doesn't make sense, just, just follow this pattern, right? Just do, do, do what they've done. Um, and then basically what we're going to do is like make ourselves a string to return back to say hello name. Um, and then get hold of all of the previous names. Um, which we need to, we need to lock this mutex to do that. So past names is of type app state. Um, and we need to, um, uh, lock the mutex by calling lock, and we have to wait for that lock to happen because this is a Tokyo mutex, which uh, which we is a mutex that we await. Now we've got a list of names. Uh, if it's not if we if some if we've seen some names before, then we print them out basically. We'll write them out into response rather, and then we send back response as our answer. So this is how we return a string to get sent back to um, the browser that, that talked to us. We wrap it up in this HTML thing, which is another type from Tokyo. Um, but just before we do that, we add the name that we've just seen to our past name. So next time we come in, uh, past names will include this new name we've just seen. So that's just an example of like, basically in order to, to handle a web request, you just write an async function. You put in the list of arguments of all the information you want, and then you return some kind of, um, HTML, which gets sent back to the browser. Okay, so um, just to summarize the last few videos before we get on to some exercises, um, we've been talking about async code in Rust. In order to understand that, we talked about the future trait, uh, what a future is and how it has a poll method. Um, and we talked about what happens to your code after the compiler sees it when you've used the async and await keywords. And it kind of expands it into this state machine, which has a poll. Well, the poll method is the state machine, I guess. Then we talked about run, this time we talked about runtimes, like Tokyo, which are the things that actually call poll for you to make sure that your async code actually gets chugged through and uh, done. And then we had a really quick look at um, how you can use this stuff to do web programming 
uh, and what it looks like to write code using the Axum framework. So any questions or comments or improvements, uh, let me know below. Hope you're enjoying the series. Next time we will do some exercises on this stuff, which might help um, clarify anything that's been confusing. Um, let me know whether you're enjoying the series. I'm like so many videos, 30, I never expected 37 videos. Uh, and we're not there yet. There's plenty more to go. Um, let me know whether you're enjoying it, um, what you'd like to see differently. And also let me know whether you'd like me to cover other things. I'm considering going through the Rust book um, in a future series of videos and just talking through how to understand all of that. So let me know if that would be something you'd be interested in. Um, hope you're enjoying. See you next time.